Yeah, I think um, given that the, um, the pandemic response tends to be multi-sectoral, right, it's um, very easy to ask a question in terms of who should take the leadership in that. Should it be someone from the security forces to enforce lockdowns, for instance? Um, should it be um, a coordinated minister like the Minister for National Planning or the Minister of Finance, given the economic impact? But I think there's an opportunity for a leadership role to be played by everyone. And definitely for the Minister of Health in particular, um, I think there are opportunities and ways that they can play a visible and you know, a very important leadership role. And I think I'll, I'll say, you know, three things would help, you know, that. I think the first thing I'll say is, you know, making sure you get the buy-in and affirmation from the president or the prime minister in the country, um, who is ultimately accountable for the outcome of everything in the country. And I think having that direct, you know, communication line um, with the president or prime minister is very important because he's the one that would apportion, will set up whatever committee that needs to be set up. So that communication line is very important. The second thing I would say would be, you know, to um, take the lead in, in communicating um, to the other sectors how the epidemic can actually affect them, right? In cases where you find that you're not getting this sort of level of cooperation um, because it's fundamentally seen as a healthcare problem, um, the Minister of Health can put together briefs or have talking points in terms of how this can impact other sectors. For instance, the impact on education, um, and the impact on the economy to the Minister of Finance, um, the impact on the transport sector and aviation, for instance, or the impact on agriculture. And if the Minister of Health takes that initiative, and that's a way of also leading the cabinet ministers and helping them understand why this is a burning platform that they need to respond to. And the last point is really following up on that. How can the Minister of Health begin to identify ways other sectors could get involved and do something about it? And for this, he needs to sort of learn their language, so to speak, and um, articulate to the finance minister how, what they can do and how that will benefit them in the long run and do that with other ministries. So it's first to get the, so just in summary, it's first get the alignment with the president and prime minister um, who has overall, you know, coordinated responsibilities. Secondly, you know, pre-identify the impact of the epidemic on other sectors and so that that can inform conversations with, you know, other ministerial colleagues. And then thirdly, think of ways and what they can do to support in their respective sectors, you know, um, the response um, to the epidemic. In that way, um, the Minister of Health can definitely, you know, um, take play a leadership role in driving and galvanizing an effective response um, without necessarily stepping on anyone's toes, so to speak. And central to uh, any response um, would be the data and information. That's really important um, because firstly, it gives a true assessment of where things are. Um, secondly, the tracking of the data gives a sense of progress, right? And you can carry the population along. And um, it also helps you um, identify areas that one needs to prioritize. Now, there are um, pieces of information, indicators that should be tracked daily. And these largely center around the outcome indicators. So things like the number of cases, right? Whether they are suspected cases or confirmed cases. For instance, during the Ebola um, 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 crisis in Nigeria, every time the minister communicated, he led with how many suspected cases we had and how many cases were confirmed. Um, and so that way we could see, you know, follow through how many of those suspected cases were either became confirmed cases or were negative and therefore were no longer confirmed cases. So in this particular instance, right, contact and direct contacts could be also um, listed as the suspected cases, 
who have been monitored and have been tested and then confirmed cases. And these numbers need to be updated daily. In addition, um, uh, uh, um, the outcome of the cases, number of cases that we have and the outcomes of those cases, basically how many have been discharged to go home and then how many fatalities we have. It's particularly important to also communicate how many people have been discharged um, because there's always a tendency to only report the negative news and negative information. So we hear about how many cases a country has and how many deaths. Yes, we can all do the math, but it will be a more positive um, piece of information that gives people more hope when you also communicate how many people have been discharged. So in Nigeria, for instance, at this moment, there's a dashboard by the Nigerian Center for Disease Control that lists number of cases, number of patients discharged, and number of um, fatalities um, that we have. So it's really important. That is updated at least once a day. Um, in some cases, depending on the stage of the epidemic, it could be updated maybe twice a day or three times a day. And so those are the outcome indicators. There are other things that the leadership should track um, that they don't necessarily always have to share with the public, but it's important to, two things come to mind. One is really around the response capacity. A lot of countries at the moment um, were sort of caught by surprise and didn't have some of the robust um, uh, equipment to or robust response in place for such epidemics. And in such cases, they need to track the number of beds available, number of basic equipment like ventilators and critical care facilities, um, also number of trained health workers that could staff and adequately man you know, these um, interventions. So the government should track those because that gives a sense of, you know, at any time there's a surge in capacity, what's the government's ability to respond appropriately. And the second thing that could be tracked is also like um, just the commodities, right? The stockouts rates or the availability of basic things like um, personal protective equipment, how many hospitals have, you know, infection um, control um, systems in place, um, the number of test kits available, and so the testing capacity of the country. I mean, that could be done weekly um, uh, because I'm not sure these things change very rapidly on a day-to-day -day basis. But that gives you a sense, particularly if there's a certain target based on models that, that have been you know, designed in terms of the expected number of cases, it's good to overlay you know, the amount of capacity to respond to the number of cases expected because that would help government plan and make the necessary adjustments and preparations um, and stay ahead of the problem. So those are sort of the inputs and processes that will be I think weekly may make sense for those, but in terms of updating, um, tracking the progress of the epidemic and the type of information that will be communicated to the population, I think that should be done daily and, you know, and that routine should be maintained. And a simple dashboard would help to just um, provide you that data on the number of suspected cases, confirmed cases, and the outcomes of those cases, but those, where uh, they have been discharged, as well as where fatalities have occurred. When this is all over, and um, we're all like eagerly waiting for this to be all over, the, the world would change. And there's no, there's no doubt about it. Um, a lot of economies will be struggling. Um, because of the um, predicted recession um, that many countries may have. Um, the fracture and the disruption in society would also be very evident. Um, and, and so many things will change. The health sector will not be spared the change, but I, I, I see it for, as an opportunity, right, for rebirth and rebuilding systems and really um, question in some of the things we know about health systems reforms. I think it's an opportunity to go beyond, you know, the incremental approaches to health systems reforms that we've undertaken over the years and look at where there's been potential disruption. Um, uh, 
two things, I mean, I'll just touch on, I mean, um, come to mind. There's the focus on rebuilding resilient health systems that's, you know, it was touched on during the Ebola um, crisis, but has sort of, you know, faded into the background. And I think this is a reminder that strong health systems are needed, not just, you know, for the sake of improving health outcomes, but given the impact on the overall macroeconomy and on the overall and on society as a whole. So how do we build better surveillance systems? How do we build better data systems? How do we build on strong primary health care systems? And also, beyond primary health care, how do we build strong systems um, that include secondary and tertiary care, right? For instance, people will, may fall sick and may require specialized care. So should we think of more cost-effective and um, appropriate ways of handling such things in low-income and middle-income countries. Um, so I think building the new healthcare system where we imagine care as not being delivered in just a building, but as people interacting with systems as a whole that are dynamic and systems that are responsive, irrespective of the assault or the disease or the condition. I think this gives that opportunity to go back to the drawing board and really rethink and reimagine how we want to create health systems. I think there'll be more appetite for, for that right now than asking for just marginal improvements in, in systems. That's one big change I see would happen. The second thing is really the role of technology and innovation. I think um, given where what we've seen, where a lot of consultation has been provided remotely. We have seen the importance of getting um, telemedicine and e-health rights, where consultations can happen and will be happening more remotely. Can we, can we get better at it? Um, can we put in place the right regulatory infrastructure to enable remote consultations? And that's one of the uh, big things that'll come out of this. Another thing that's where we will have technology innovation um, be important is in the area of diagnostics. One of the things that's come out is how difficult it is to r ramp up and the importance of the waiting time between when a test is taken and when the results are out. So the push to developing point of care diagnostics will become huge. And then how quickly do we go through the regulatory and approval processes for diagnostics and for treatments and for new drugs? So I see a lot of innovation, both in terms of technology, in terms of products, but also in terms of regulations and ca rapidly catching up with the disruptions and the changes that we're seeing. Um, but that's one of the things I think will be opportunities. And, 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 and these things being woven into the new health systems that we're rebuilding and reimagining. So for instance, I see a situation where rather than have the normative approach to training multiple health workers, we will begin to look at the instances where health workers that are skilled can provide support to people in more remote locations with a better uh, revised form of telemedicine that has all the necessary quality controls and um, regulatory um, uh, enablers to make that work well. So that might be a new way of looking at the health system rather than looking at norms like number of community health workers per thousand population, etc. So those are things I expect would, would happen. Um, it would be a tragedy if after all this, we go back to business as usual, and there is no change to the way we engage with the health system. There are no reforms you know, to the health system, and we wait for the next disaster um, to begin to discuss you know, and begin to argue and talk about ideological views about how a health system should be run. That, to me, would be the biggest disaster if we don't learn from this and really innovate um, and build 
real health systems that are responsive to our current and future realities.